I was kind of a pack rat. I'm not anymore. <laughs> I'm not allowed to be. I, I, do, I don't need to be a pack rat anymore. I used up all my inventory on this house, which is good. Now I don't have to live that lifestyle anymore. And then when we started building this house, I had this amazing inventory of things that I could just go rummage through and just solve all these problems with. Welcome to the Art of Custom from Hibbs Homes. Sponsored by Pella Window and Doors and Ferguson Bath Kitchen and Lighting Gallery. Hi again, everyone. Kim Hibbs and Melody Miner. So happy to have you with us for the Art of Custom podcast. Melody, we're actually expanding. This is episode 12, and you know we usually don't work overtime. We normally do 10 episodes throughout the course of the season, but we've had such a fun season, we wanted to do a couple of extras, and that Halloween one that we just did was wonderful. Yeah, I was so excited to do that. I, I'm not kidding when I say we need to look for more opportunities like that. It was so much fun. Uh, and, and with this episode, we ran across a really cool idea that was local to St. Louis. Again, True. And we felt like it would be fun to bring in an additional bonus episode, I guess you could call it. And what's interesting about this is because usually when people are looking for design advice, a lot of times they'll go to magazines or they'll go to Pinterest, they'll go to Howes. Um, and that's where most people start looking for some of that information, right? Absolutely. And the person we're going to talk to today actually goes to groups and talks about precisely that, but it's with recycled materials and all kinds of He's an artist. Stuff. Yeah, an artist. Like, <laughs> Truly, his home is a work of art. We were able to have him into the studio because, like you say, he's from the St. Louis area. And I've heard a lot about container homes, which is something he's going to talk about. Never really had a chance to dig deeply into them and find out more about, you know, the process, the cost. I thought it was very interesting, the conversation we had with him about cost. So I think this is one episode that our listeners will find very interesting, even though they might not be wanting to build a container home. He's really open to helping others. Just a real great guy. Yeah, so this is Zach Smithy, process artist out of St. Charles, Missouri. His home was featured on a number of media outlets, including episode three of Netflix's Amazing Zach, it is an absolute pleasure to have you join us in the studio. Thank you very much. We need to find out more about your background. So tell us how you got into the container homes, what drew you in that direction, and just kind of fill us in on on some of your background, if you would. Um, well, thanks for having me. So if we want to go way back. Sure, why not? One of the questions at the last presentation I just came from, they asked me, was I thinking about doing this since I was a kid? And I think uh, subconsciously, maybe, but wow. consciously not. I used to love building with Legos, and back in the 80s when I was a kid, and there was that commercial, Zach the Lego Maniac, and everybody <laughs> called me that, and uh, so here we are 30, 40 years later, and I'm building houses out of giant Lego blocks or containers. It's amazing. So what gave you the idea to do this? So I'm a professional artist, and my wife and I had renovated several homes over the last couple decades, and each one got a little closer to being us. We were renovating an existing home from homes back in the 1800s to early 1900s to then 1970 was our last one. And then we thought, we just need to build something from scratch. Mm -hmm. That's us. And economically, and we wanted to recycle, repurpose, be sustainable. And um, we were thinking about, you know, concrete home, geodesic dome, uh, earth home, and shipping containers checked all of our boxes economically and sustainability. So that's what we went with. So take us back when you first came up with the decision to build a, a container home. How do you start the process? Where do you go? Where do you learn, if you will, how to do it? We were the first ones to build in the St. Louis region. And we now wish that we had somebody like us at the time to ask questions of. But since I'm not a trained architect or engineer or a carpenter, I look at this not from that point of view. I'm an artist, so I'm looking at it and problem solving it um, where anything is possible. There are no limitations. So let's just figure this out. And with a container home, do it to where it doesn't leak and, you know, it looks like a house on the inside. I didn't have to really follow any codes as far as like 
none of the walls are structural because the containers are the structure. So I had the freedom of building with 24-inch on center studs and not having to do with big, thick headers above the doorways because, you know, it's not holding anything up. Everything is kind of floating there in place. So the first thing that comes to mind is, did the inspectors understand the process and did they embrace it or did you have any kind of pushback? So there were certain people within the city who loved what we were doing and then there were others who didn't. I think the inspectors were on board. But when we went and filed for the permit, everybody looked at each other like, uh, I don't know. Uh, we, nobody's ever asked us before. So they didn't have any ordinances against container homes. So they had to pass it because I passed all of the uh, structural codes. And when they came to inspect it, they brought in a few of the younger inspectors. They brought in a few of the more seasoned inspectors. It wasn't just one. There were a handful of them there. And the younger ones were pointing and saying, oh, what about these headers? What, what about this over here? And the guy said, it's not structural. It doesn't apply here. And he's like, no, that doesn't apply either. And so wow. they only flagged me on a couple of things. I'm learning throughout the process, and I didn't know that a certain percentage of your floor space per floor had to be allocated for ventilation. Mm -hmm. And so I barely missed the requirement on the main floor. And we had these 100-year-old church windows on the front that are arched windows. And it's always the first question people ask, why are the arched windows upside down? And it's those arched windows. And since I just barely missed the ventilation requirement, I'm looking like, how am I going to solve this problem without cutting another hole and mm -hmm. putting another window in? So I just smashed out a few of the um, window panes in that old window and then built little glass uh, window doors at, with screens in it so that I could have like extra ventilation but keep the full old antique window there. Every day was a new problem to solve. And it, to me, you come across as someone who looks at the challenges and looks for ways to solve them and enjoyed the whole process. Yeah. Not until you're put into a difficult situation do you have to come up with a creative solution. So I went in there with a general design and general idea. I had the floor plan. That was about it. Then we're going to figure it out as we go. Every day <laughs> it's like, okay, let's figure this room out. Let's figure that out because – it had never been done before, or at least not around here. Well, I'm going to ask the obvious question then. Why are the windows upside down? Mm -hmm. Originally, I had enough of these windows to do upside down on the main floor, right side up, directly above them on the top floor, and it would have been a mirror image. Um, so I had them out back. I'm refinishing them, and a storm comes out of nowhere. And I could only get so many of them inside, and a few of them blew over and smashed. And then we didn't have enough to do the uh, top floor. And I had my head set on this design, so I said, this is the main living space where they're going to be upside down. Let's just see what they look like. And I put them in there, and we all loved it, so they stayed upside down. <laughs> and actually, so those 8-foot by 5-foot windows, they're only single pane. So... I did make a sacrifice. I did have extra windows, but I took those, siliconed them around the perimeter and screwed them together. So that's two windows siliconed together. So it is double pane. We do a lot of green home building and um, you use a lot of recycled materials in your home. Yes. And so um, what is the push for the recycled materials? So what led you to that? Being an artist, I'd started out small scale making furniture out of recycled materials and I always look at things kind of like a little kid looks at something and he has no experience with what this object is. So they look at it with fresh eyes like, well, I don't know, what could this be? So that's my, my thing is I look at something that is an old architectural piece of scrap or it could be anything. I like the way this looks and I don't care what it was. What can it be? And then we just go from there. I was kind of a pack rat. I'm not anymore. <laughs> I'm not allowed to be. I, I, do, I don't need to be a pack rat anymore. Um, I used up all my inventory on this house, which is good. Now I don't have to live that lifestyle anymore. But I had had all these cool architectural scrap pieces that I had saved over the years just waiting for something to use them. And then when we started building this house, it's like I had this amazing inventory of things 
that I could just go rummage through and just solve all these problems with. Let's <laughs> say one of our clients had architectural items uh-huh. that they, I mean, how would we, we approach that? We welcome it because quite frankly, in some of our homes, we've installed some old stained glass, mm-hmm. you know, in different applications, like in Kirkwood, for example, one of the homes that was the home of the year, we actually took some of the, the stained glass that they absolutely loved. They found it in an antique store and we, we inserted it inside their house in a special location. So we've done that before, whether it's flooring or whether it's special, you know, tubs or gl- stained glass. Yeah. And I was interested because when you were talking about salvaging materials and things like that, Melody knows this, we like to deconstruct our homes yes. and, and repurpose the materials either in the house we're building or we donate it to um, Habitat for Humanity in their restore right. so they can sell it and then use the money to build homes for people. And it so we kind of com- think a lot alike. Yeah, yeah. And it always comes out being more interesting that way yes. too because you couldn't have planned for that. Yeah. And it's like not off the shelf like everybody else's stuff. Yes, it's Completely exactly. unique. So you mentioned you're an artist. Do you specialize in anything or do you work so, in a lot of different mediums or what? I specialize in something that makes me not specialize in a certain thing. So <laughs> my specialty is I'm an interdisciplinary process artist. So interdisciplinary, I'm always exploring different processes, okay. different techniques, different materials. And I'm focused on more the how I make art huh. than what I make. So that leads me down many different pathways of discovery. It's kind of like a treasure hunt mm-hmm. in – the process. It's more about the journey than the destination. So you must have some really cool touches inside your house then. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I I treat my homes like a piece of art with pieces of art inside of them. So the whole thing, you know, and this journey with the containers is just part of your creative flow. You were just looking for something on a larger scale to do. And this seems perfect for you. Exactly. Yeah. I just treat it like a giant sculpture. Through my 20 plus years of exploring different techniques and styles, I can do anything from realistic portraiture to realistic figure work, realistic landscapes to abstract expressionism to textural work to sculptures, uh, you name it. If you see my website, you'll see like an enormous variety. And we'll make sure we have that in show notes because I know Absolutely. Melody, she never misses a chance to promote our guests. So right. that's pretty cool. So what did, what did you learn from this? I mean, pros and cons? I'll say one of the biggest surprises was how difficult it was to cut the walls out and remove the metal. How heavy that 12 to 14 gauge steel was. Then I had to figure out what size I can manageably cut them out and carry them them out myself because I did the majority of the construction myself. Oh, wow. Um, and it How took long a, did it take? A year and two weeks. Okay. Seven days a week. I took off five days total that year. Oh, my like gosh. Like Christmas, Thanksgiving, you know, like other than that, it was all day, every day, sun up to sundown. So we kept the original hardwood floors from the containers mm. and we put a whitewash resin over it. And when I started cutting the walls out, I was using an oxycetylene torch and it was shooting hot metal slag and it was kind of burning up the floors. Mm -hmm. Although that was the easiest way of cutting the walls, it was also the messiest way. Then I switched to plasma and I used plasma in certain spots, but it also left a melty end, which isn't very good for like attaching like trim or anything to it Mm -hmm. because it's not a, a clean cut. So then I went back to my side grinder and a cutoff wheel And those cutoff discs, those four-inch black cutoff discs, would get me about six to eight feet of cutting. And I went through 200 of those discs. (laughs) But it was the best way for what I was doing. It was just really, really hard. Would you do it again? Yeah, but I wouldn't look forward to it.
So tell me about the process when you, you consult on container homes, and I believe you worked with one other person that built a house in North. Old North, Old right North. a block behind yeah. Crown Candy. And there's yeah. three stories tall, nine containers, three containers on each floor. So I designed that home and then hired a crew to do the construction. Because you learned your lesson. Yes. <laughs> I'm not doing this anymore. Although they did rope me into doing a few things there, especially touches like the floating bed that mounts straight to the wall and just comes straight out like a monolith, no legs. I would actually like to ramp up construction of container homes or just alternative building material homes. But the problem is unless you're building constantly, it's hard to keep a, a dedicated crew on hand. Because then they're off working on other things, and I'm not consistent in my construction. I'm like, yeah, we'll build one here. We'll build one there. And so then I have to come in and do a lot of the work, and I don't want to. Oh, Kim, I, I'm, I'm hearing some familiar. I was going to say, you know, <laughs> right. you're preaching to the choir because we, as a, as a decent-sized custom builder, have the same issues. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and especially the last few years. Yeah, I labor mean, shortages and all. Labor it's been tough. It's, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. been crazy. Well, I commend you for for not only taking on such a cool project, but but doing a lot of the work yourself and then kind of launching out. Are you enjoying working with others who wanted to build container homes and all? I do, but I am ready to start building more independent structures myself, so okay. I'm not limited to the design and the budget of the client. I just want to control the entire process from mm -hmm. start to finish. I would welcome like an investor who wants to come in and you know be a part of it but not get in the way. Right. Um, kind I, of a I, silent partner. <laughs> right, right, right. I, I would take your input. You know, I'm easy to work with. Right. Um, but yeah, I just, I want to control that creative process the entire way, just like it's a piece of art. So the difference between small homes and container homes, could a container home be a small home? Or? Yeah. When I say container home, a lot of times people think I live in a tiny home. But oh, I've I, seen them. They're not. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Uh, so a 40-foot container, actually, I, th I don't think it would qualify as a tiny home because it's 320 square feet, but a 20-footer would, mm -hmm. would be 160 square feet. That would be a tiny home. So I used eight 40-foot high cubes, and high cubes have nine-foot ceilings as, a, as opposed to the standard eight on top of an 11-foot foundation. And so our house is like 3,100 square feet, so it's not exactly a tiny home. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it can be, you know. Are you finding as you go into all of these projects that there are new regulations that you have to meet? And um, actually, so now the regulations are catching up with us. Now there are codes in the actual code book on container homes, oh, such cool. as you can clear cut a wall up to 20 feet mm. without having to add any structural elements. So that kind of helps, I would imagine. It because does. it's giving you some guidance. Right, guidelines. right. I don't have to just figure it yeah. out, you know, or, yeah. and I don't have to be overly cautious and over engineer because there aren't any standards. Now they give us the standards. I know what the minimum requirement is mm -hmm. for that structure. So you used the word budget a little bit earlier. And, mm -hmm. and I know that, I mean, I hate it when people say to me, how much is this going to cost? Because there's so many variables. I get that. I, yeah. I really do. Right. Is there a way to quantify or give us a budget range of what people should be expecting if they're building a container home? Mm -hmm. So when I built mine and I got my containers for $1,600 each, okay. now they've maybe doubled or tripled supply shortages. Mm -hmm. And I did almost all the work myself. So I built my 3,100 square foot home for 135000 which mm -hmm. is like $43 a square foot. Right. The next one I built for the client in Old North was about $108 a square foot. But we found out after hiring a, a crew to do it that, man, now we're on a razor thin budget. We need to charge more on the next one. Right. Um, and then, you know, supply shortages, prices go up. Now we're at around $200 a square foot. So it's not much cheaper, mm -hmm. if at all, than standard construction. You save in certain areas, but you got to spend mm -hmm. in other areas. So basically what you're getting is a novelty. It's, mm -hmm. it's unique. You're paying for you know, the uniqueness of it. And that really, I mean, we're sitting here talking about mine, the marketing value of what I built, it's on Netflix, it's everywhere. It's paid for itself many times oh, gosh, yeah. in the marketing. So that's something to take in consideration. And that's why when I start building these creative Airbnbs, I think that is the way to go. It's more of something that's going to pay itself off as people want to stay there and experience this. How many projects have you done in the St. Louis area? Built three, 
designed and consulted on one in Eureka, which I haven't followed up on yet, just because then I gave the homeowners the option of being their own GC, which mm-hmm. they did. And uh, I am I have to reach back out to see how they did with that. Let's see how it's going. <laughs> I, did, I did some designs for some other people in other cities. and okay. um, Tell us a little bit about what it's like to design for somebody from afar. So I am an analog designer. I'm, I'm an artist, so I like to sketch. I like to draw it out. It's like the old school way. I still draw it to scale, but I'm drawing, taking a photo, sending it to them. They're telling me, you know, give me feedback. And then we just keep going back and forth until they like what they see and, and see how it functions with the floor plan of what they need as a client. Like what, how do they want to live and experience the space. And so we just keep going back and forth like that until I can give them a design that they can give to their architect. In your home, in the Netflix special, we got to see a lot of really cool recycled materials that you used. And the other homes that you've worked with, I mean, you can't really incorporate that same touch, can you? No, no. uh, I mean, other than the structure itself, you know, I, I'm not building for myself. I'm building for them. And, you know, I have to f- let go of certain aspects of the final product and hand it off to them and let them finish it off that way. When you're working with people, what are some of the neater ideas that you've had from them? Or like what, what advice would you give to people who are maybe even building a traditional home? I love problems, creative problem solving and coming up with unique solutions in my limited experience with the last couple, I have felt like my hands were a little tied in what my budget was and what their taste was and what their needs were. So I couldn't be as creative as my potential would be. That's just because you know, these are my first two after my, my own. So I'm limited in my experience, and which is another reason why the next few I want to handle myself from the ground up. We're going to start with the Airbnb uh, okay. process in St. Louis. Which get I think my, is terrific. Yeah, get my feet wet there. Then my wife and I couldn't figure out where we would want to live if we didn't live here, uh, although she knows that a beach will be there. Um, <laughs> and we had several different locations. So after we built a few Airbnbs here, we want to just maybe pick out a few places that we would like to maybe live and just go build Airbnbs there so that we can just go float around yeah. and experience all of the properties while they pay for themselves. So she's fully on board with this, it sounds like. What was her reaction to the process? Does she like the house? Oh, she loves it. And my wife has become more creative every day in the last 20 years that we've been together. I do the initial design, mm-hmm. construction, and like building of the unique features. And she, for one, kind of reels me back in when I have really crazy ideas. And she kind of brings me back to reality a little bit. And she also does the finishing touches, the interior design, and turns it into a, a cozy home. And you had mentioned that you spoke to the group that you just came back from about art in their home, too. So what did you talk to them about whenever you went in and spoke to them? The primary focus of that presentation was the upcycling aspect. And so I really got into the details and showed them specific features, like using a claw foot from a claw foot tub to hold up the handrail going down the stairs. Oh, cool. Or using those giant wooden cable spools, cutting those up and using them as the stair treads going up the stairs and using some more of them as the countertops. So I got into more of the details of what exactly the things used to be and what they are now. Do you store items like that? Do you have like... I used to. Okay. And up until earlier this year, I I did because I had a 12,000 square foot warehouse art studio, but that building sold and I had to move out. And now all of my inventory is in storage and I had to get rid of all of my my saved items. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that must have been difficult. Yeah, yeah. It you know, it was like an episode of Hoarders when they're like, "Oh, I don't know. I might use that one day." And Yeah, they, but I think you look at those items so much more differently than the rest of us. And but you, I actually do use those yeah, items. Yeah, exactly. So it's yeah. there's a difference there. <laughs> it was just really hard to let go of a lot of things and my wife is like, "Do you want to pay storage on this?" I'm like, "No. Let's just <laughs> let's just get rid of it all." You let's had to th- bring common sense into this conversation. Yeah, let's let's clean house. So in addition to the container homes, do you do interior consultations then too for people who want to upcycle their interior design? 
I'm open to the possibility, but I don't. For the last several years, I've been perpetually booked out months in advance with art commissions. Okay. And that that brings me more happiness and makes more money. We, of course, as a custom builder, most of the people that we deal with are building a traditional home. Now, we've done some things like the uh, the SIPS panels or some, you know, ICF foundations and things like that. So if someone is listening to this podcast and starts to think, container home, hmm, that might be interesting. Is it for everyone or, or what do you tell someone if they're, if they're getting that light bulb moment to think about a container home? I would say it's it's not for everyone, but it can be. Um, they can be modified almost any way if your budget allows. I'm actually kind of over container homes personally. Oh. Um, <laughs> ex- okay. Even though I love them, I'm looking for the next new thing. So what is that going to be? Well, I'm using a new ICF block um, okay. for my extension. Which block? The perfect block. Okay. So, um, the ICF no is insulated concrete forms. I yes. was just going to say, you guys yeah. need to tell me what you're talking about. Insulated the, concrete forms. So, you basically have the insulation on the outside. It's like a block that you put together like Legos. You eventually pour the concrete in the middle of it. So, these are four foot blocks. Larger. Mm hmm. And they're 12 inches tall, okay. 10 inches deep, R30. Once it's poured, R30, once it's stacked the, up and poured, you've okay. got an R30 wall. Okay. Which and, is very good. Right. And normal ICF blocks use the white EPS foam. Correct. And rodents and insects can burrow through that. So you have to oh. do like a protective paneling or something to keep prevent that from happening. Mm-hmm. Fire, it'll melt. Um, mm-hmm. Not the concrete, but the foam. The, the foam, yeah. These EPS blocks, they recycle EPS foam, grind it down into little pieces, mix that foam with cement to form the oh, blocks. Okay. So it's fireproof. Insects and rodents can't burrow through it. Um, you don't have to do siding on it. You can just paint it. Just like the container homes, we were the first to build those in the St. Louis region. I'll be the first to use these in the St. Louis region. Interesting. So, so help me understand a little bit better. The block itself, you do eventually pour the concrete or is the block? Okay. Yeah. So in these blocks, instead of having a monolithic pour Uh between the two pieces of foam, it's six six inch cores on every 12 inches going vertically and horizontally. Wow. So you have a six inch grid. Channel. Yeah. Yeah. Of concrete once you pour it. And in each channel, there's a bar of rebar going through there. And so we're going to use it below grade and above grade, three stories tall. So we need to stay in touch with you, obviously, because as, as high-performance builders, we do a lot of times have people come to us and say, what is something different than we can do? Of course, in, in the St. Louis area, earthquakes, tornadoes, a lot of people are concerned about that as well. Oh, yeah. So I, super you might strong. be on to something. I think that's pretty cool. Give me some, some uh, cost comparisons between typical ICF foundation or this foundation. Do you have any idea yet? Um, with these blocks finished with the concrete poured in them come at about 10 or 11 dollars a square foot okay. a board foot of the wall right That's which not is bad right especially when you consider that you're also saving with construction costs yes because it's it's one and done stack it up and you're done um, do you have to have a footing on under it or what yeah you- so I'm gonna do um, monolithic pour footing into the slab on the in the basement okay and then I'll have the rebar sticking, sticking out up. every 12 inches, which then I'll put my block and go straight and you up say from there. below grade. This is used below grade. You don't have to yep. – do you have to waterproof it? Well, I'll do the standard tar or whatever okay. on the outside, but you don't need it. Okay. I'm and just going to do it just in case. you've got your insulation factor of a 30, your R30. Yeah. You've got your your structure – um, so you're, you're right. There is a, in my mind, this would be a product to look into versus a conventionally poured foundation at some point. Too. Yeah, absolutely. The perfect block. So I'm going to use it for three stories tall. Wow. So I'll we build. need to follow this melody. I know. Put on your thinking cap. I uh, know that. And, you know, yeah. it reminds me of the 3D printed homes that are. Yeah. Oh, I'd like to check those we, out too. That's absolutely.
You know, I kind of want to change the whole thing to making your home a work of art. I mean, like that's that's, that's literally your yeah. Your... It's the home is a piece of art filled with my art. Yeah, See, I think that's really cool. Yeah, and that's another theme of these uh, Airbnbs that I want to do. Themed Airbnbs tend to do better. I love do that. an You're experience. Right. You're right, and I want ours to be an art installation. It's going to be an art gallery that you get to stay in. And I'll also bring in other artists who also have a show. That's a good idea. And then people can stay in there and they can buy the art off the wall if they want to. And um, You got it all planned out. Yeah, yeah. My, my wife, she has a, a supplement company selling protein powders because we're into fitness yeah, too. Yeah, I can tell. And so, <laughs> so, so we want that to be a part of the experience too. We want to cater to – like every time we stay somewhere, we're like, does it have a gym? Yeah. Uh, is, is there anything healthy to eat around there? So we want to stock it with some of her health supplements, place to work out, place to relax, and a place to see art. So, Melody, we definitely, I mean, there's so many things that down the road, as that goes further with I the know. Airbnbs and with the perfect block and all, we, we should have him back periodically yeah. just to kind of update everything. And just so you know, you're hearing my boss is telling me to stalk you. So, uh, yeah. I mean, like, hey, when that's I what stalk social you. media she's is gonna, for. She's going to do it in a good way, though. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> but no, yes. I, I have to believe that our listeners across the country will find this very interesting as well. Um, just because you're presenting such different options in, in many different ways to build a home and, and to finish a home and things like that. So that's absolutely cool. what baffles me is that we're not driving Model T's around anymore. We're, we're drive, we have self driving Teslas. So why are our homes still made out of the same things that we, they were hundreds or thousands of years ago? When it comes to homes, I'm still new at this. Mm -hmm. I feel like I, I will be a continual learner, and I'm always looking for the next better thing. Mm -hmm. How can I refine this just a little bit more and a little bit more until we get somewhere completely new? And Melody had mentioned the printed homes, house, the printed yeah. houses, yeah, and it's amazing what they're doing with those. So I commend you for having the vision and having the drive to do that because that's what our industry needs. It really does. It needs people like you who kind of look at this as a little bit of a challenge and, and look at ways to do something a little bit different, a little bit better. And then it's going to drive other builders to think about the way they do things as well. I mean, we took the step of becoming a high performance builder before the codes made us go there anyway. Right. And so now we're continually looking for ways to build a better home above code because we don't want to be just a code builder. Right. But to you're taking it to kind of a whole different level. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Code building, that's like the bare minimum. Yeah, exactly. How can we go above yeah, and beyond? Yeah. How can we go above and beyond, which is what our motto has always been. I mean, our show's the art of custom. Hey, <laughs> that's true. I'm thinking about our clients up in Utah that have like their artwork is built into their floor plans and mm -hmm. things like that, too. I mean, I think there's so many different applications that, yeah. you know, absolutely this, this fits with. So. Zach, you've been great. Thank you so much. Thanks it was, for having uh, me. It was a pleasure that you stopped by the studio. Uh, Melody is going to continue stalking you because yes. we want to update our listeners periodically on what you're doing. And then Melody will yes. have all of your information and pictures and contact information and yes. all on our show notes as well. Yes, listeners, I will, I will give you the tools to also stalk Zach. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Melody, you know when we come back out of interviews, a lot of times I like to have tried to, to maybe have one idea or something that really stood out about an interview. Here's the problem with the interview with Zach. There's about a dozen things I'd like to bring up because it was that interesting and he had such great information. We wanted to talk to him about how you could make a home personalized, mm -hmm. and it turned into a discussion about literally living in a work of art, and I thought that was just so cool. And he does, as we've discussed, and the cool thing about it is he's willing to help others. He wants to help others. Now, container living is not going to be for everybody, but what I really appreciated about him is the way he tries to, you know, really look at whatever items are in his world and how he can find multiple purposes for them and use them within the house somewhere. Absolutely. And we're going to link to his Instagram account, which is absolutely awesome. There are commissioned pieces. There's one he recently completed that was just incredible with Abe Lincoln and Mary Todd Lincoln. <laughs> Lots of really cool artwork on there, and you can see, obviously, his home as well. That'll be a lot of fun. Also, we're going to link to um, his website and the Netflix episode, which featured him. So a lot of great information there um, on our show notes. And here we are. We made it to the end of... This is it? We don't have any more bonus episodes? I mean, if we get a wild hair, maybe. <laughs>
<laughs> what we'll do is we'll come back. How about if we just have some some bonus drops? If there's something interesting going on in our industry, we'll come back with those periodically before season number six kicks off early next year. How about that? Or if we, or if we run across somebody cool like Zach again. Well, then we'll just hold him for, okay. for season six. Okay, guys. Because I know we'd already talked about wanting to do something with 3D printing, yeah. which has become extremely popular. So we're actually beginning to put our ideas together, and we would love to hear from our listeners if you have anything that you would like us to cover. How do they get a hold of us? They can call us at 314-266-9709 or reach us through our website or social media. You'll be able to contact us. Season 5 in the books. It's been a lot of fun. What was your favorite episode? Honestly, it was the weather episode, I think. It was very interesting. We have a little bit of severe weather popping up in the south right now, Mm -hmm. and I've been watching that. (laughs) Well, we've discussed this during that episode. You're a self-described weather nerd, so I I don't even know why I asked you that question. There were several I enjoyed, but I really think that the Halloween where we visited the Lemp Mansion. Now, again, I know it took us off course a little bit from what we normally do, but you know what? It was just a fun episode. Perfect time of year. I thought Sarah did a wonderful job editing it, and it just was such a fun podcast. I mean, did it really take us off course, though? I mean, we were a home podcast. Right? True, and we were inside a mansion, and we talked yeah. about some of the features inside the mansion, so yeah. I guess we didn't stray too far. Yeah. Well, season number five has been a lot of fun, but please stick around because we're in October right now as we tape this next episode, and we'll start taping again right after the first of the year. Uh, And trust us, we'll have some very interesting episodes coming up that will help you if you're thinking about building, thinking about renovating. I don't care where you live. We're going to have information that you will find helpful. Melody, it's been a great season. Thanks for your help. Absolutely. And and thanks to all of our listeners. And we hope you join us again for season six coming up after the first of the year. For more information, visit www.artofcustompodcast.com or find us on Facebook as The Art of Custom and on Twitter at Art of Custom Pod. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts to get the latest episodes, and please rate and review to help us grow. The Art of Custom is produced by Hugmonster Sound, with original music by Adam Frick-Ferdine. Thanks for listening!